changing things up. I'm opening with announcements. It's still gonna go, and it's fine. Good morning, Bethel. How is everyone? Happy Sunday morning. I'm so glad you guys are here. Um, so we do have announcements today. Um, if you are a first-time guest, there is a card in front of your seat that's blue. Um, that is a welcome card, and we just want to get to know who you are. Um, and you can put it in the wooden box that is out there in the foyer. If you have a prayer request, make sure you fill out one of the, oh, did I say the wrong color? Um, blue is actually a prayer request. So if you have a prayer request, make sure you fill out a blue one. If you're new, fill out the yellow one. Sorry, guys. You think I would know this by now. And if you want to be able to give generously your time or talent or money, that would be the red one. So we have a couple things coming up. Um, first, we have our small groups that are going on every Wednesday night. Um, Pastor Royce is, uh, is over on the fellowship side, and they're doing First Corinthians. Um, we're actually over here. Uh, Ryan's small group, Pastor Ryan's small group is over here, and we're doing um, Practicing the Way. And that starts at 630, but we are always here early um, fellowshipping. There's typically people here by 6 o'clock um, that are just here to, to have fellowship before um, small group starts. Then, um, if you would, please take a second and silence your cell phones because that has been a rising problem. Um, so we just want to address it and I'm not pointing fingers or anything. Just make sure those cell phones are off. Um, and then we have women's outing that is actually coming up and that is um, October 5th. We are meeting here at 930, but we're driving over to Brussels, right? To Whitman's. We're riding a ferry. So if you have a fear of water, I'm sorry, but come anyway, it'll be fun. Um, and it's going to be like a whole day out. So be prepared to have so much fun. Um, hopefully I get to be a part of this. I'm fingers crossed. We're trying to get our house done and it's been insane. Um, and then we have our penny drive that is outside in the foyer as well. Um, on the welcome booth, we are trying to fill um, up that jug. We're getting a penny press that is going to make um, put crosses in our pennies. Um, that's something that we're really passionate about because my father-in-law has started that. Um, and it's just something that us as a church, we want to do. It's a way that we can witness to people um, in a simple way, but yet profound way. Um, so if you have any pennies at home, make sure you bring them to fill up that um, jug before you know we start penny pressing. We're supposed to get it this next month? Two weeks we're gonna have it. So make sure you bring in your pennies, okay? All right, and then I wanted to share something um, that I was reading my Bible this morning, and um, and hold on, let me let me just put my mic up for a second. Okay, Ecclesiastes four nine says two people are better off than one, for they can help um, each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but if someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two standing back to back can conquer. So that to me means that we need each other. We are here to be together, to be unified, to be one for each other. So if we see one person falling or if we see someone you know, having a difficult time. We're not supposed to point out that they're having a difficult time. We're supposed to pick them up and walk alongside of them. So I just wanna encourage you today that you're not alone and that we're all here together. We're all for each other. Um, and that not only are we together, but God's for us as well. So I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna get into worship. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace. Thank you for this beautiful day that you've blessed us with, God. A time to be together and to worship you. God, you are worthy of all the praise. You're worthy of everything that we could give. We just pray that you would take the time to hear us as we worship you. God, we pray that you would just be in this place. That you would just move in a way that only you can that lives would be changed, Lord. I pray for healing over minds and healing over body. 
Lord, I pray that your peace would just be in this place, that your joy would fill us up. Lord, that you would walk in this room and have your way in this place. We surrender everything to you, God. We lay it at your feet. And we just welcome you in this place. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, church, why don't you stand on your feet? We're going to worship the Lord today. Never been lost, seen the water get in trouble, but we walked across. When my knees were shaking, you held my head, turning my problems to a promised land. Lead on, good shepherd, I'll follow all my days. There ain't nothing sweeter than to watch you make a way. You've walked me through the valley, but you never proved me wrong. So lead on, good shepherd, lead on. See the mighty big canyons that you brought me through. See the mighty big mountains that got up and moved. To the great unknown. So lead on, good shepherd. I'll follow all my days. There ain't nothing sweeter than to watch you make a way. You've walked me through the valley, but you never steered me wrong. So lead on, good shepherd. Lead on. Step day by day, lead me, oh Lord, I pray. Road gets dark, walk by faith. Lead, oh good shepherd. Step by step, day by day, lead me, oh Lord, I pray. Road gets dark, walk by faith. Lead, oh good shepherd. Lead, oh good shepherd. I'll follow all my days. There ain't nothing sweeter than to watch you make a way. You walk me through the valley, but you never steer me wrong. So lead on, good shepherd, lead on. Step by step, day by day, lead me, oh Lord, I pray. Road gets dark, walk by faith. Oh, good shepherd, step by step, day by day. Lead me, oh Lord, I pray. Lord, get start, walk by faith. Lead on, good shepherd. Lead on, good shepherd. 
sing it out. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you.
I give you my worship But you still deserve it You're worthy, you're worthy You're worthy of my song I pour out your praises Running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. 
This is running after, it's running after me With my life laid down and truth that reigns supreme. Lord, that we can know that in all of our life you will be faithful because that is who you are. Lord, no matter what, in the mountaintop or in the valley, with a bad diagnosis or a positive one, in our sorrow and in our joy, you are faithful faithful to the end. Lord, in your goodness, your desire for us to be closer to you doesn't ever end. Jesus, thank you so much for proving us time and time again that you are true. Lord, for giving us not just our own memories, but those of those people that have gone before us, people that are standing beside us, people in community all around us that get to say and proclaim of your goodness. 
So in our moments of weakness, we can rely on the stories of those around us. Jesus, I pray that we never lose our faith. Remind us constantly of your goodness. And we'll thank you for it. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Bethel. It is a pleasure to worship with you guys as always. At this point, the children are dismissed and they can go to their classrooms because they can learn about Jesus at their level, right? And as we've been doing the past couple weeks, take a couple minutes, get mingle, talk, catch up a little bit, and then we will jump into the Word today. Check, check, one, two. Ooh, good job. Thank you, Amos. Amos is running sound for us today. That's my son back there. I know. Mick (coughs) called me this morning and said, I'm not feeling well. And I said, thank you for letting me know. We got somebody that's capable. And uh, so I texted my wife and said, would you please ask Amos to save us today? And he he stepped right in. So thank you, buddy. Um, And he's... I like that he is willing to jump in and learn things and, and take on new challenges at the spur of a moment. He's truly becoming a pastor's kid. Uh, um, thank you guys so much for, I mean, I didn't even have to do the 30-second countdown today. Either I took a long time or you guys are ready for the sermon to get done so you can go home. One of the two, right? Um, we are in a series called Cultivating the Fruit, all about the fruit of the Spirit, right? How you guys doing enjoying it so far? Okay, good. I'm enjoying it. It's been challenging for me, and it's like kind of like 
reminding myself of where I'm at in my walk with God, where I want to be in my walk with God. So like every week that I teach to you guys, I'm like, oh, no, I, I'm incapable of this. This is not good. And so thankfully, there's the grace of God that wraps us all up and says, hey, I know you're not right where you need to be today, but you're going where you need to be. And so just stay faithful. And that's the beauty of what God is doing here at Bethel. Bethel. Um, his faithfulness is definitely... Uh, Raining true time and time again. I love Sister Rose over here just continuing in worship today. After the service was over, worship was over. I, I love hearing her in worship. That It shows me that age is just a number. And uh, whenever it comes to worship in God, she is uh, all in. And I hope that I have half the energy that she does um, and that she just, I don't know. I like it that I have people that I can look to and say, Man, I hope I can look like that one day. Um, and I hope that's what we have here at Bethel, is we have people at all ages along their walk and journey with God that maybe some look very colorful with their fruit and some look kind of grayed out. And that we can say, hey, we have something to look forward to. We have something to challenge one another with. And I think it goes both ways. I think sometimes the fruit of the Spirit, we can have some joy and excitement with some of the younger ages, but then sometimes when you get older, you lose some of that. And I think when you have a good mix of people at all walks of their journey with God, you get that experience to remind you that, oh, I lost the joy Oh, man, you're right. I haven't been as kind. Oh, that person's personality really it, you know, it counteracts what I naturally am. So I want to become more like that. And that's what the body of Christ is all about. It's a one anotherness. It's a togetherness. I need you as much as you need me, and we need each other. And that's what this is all about. Okay? That's my little tangent. I promise I won't tangent anymore. Just kidding. That's not a promise I'm going to keep at all. I will do my best not to tangent anymore. How's that? Does that work for you guys? Okay. So cultivating the fruit. We are in the new fruit goodness today. You guys excited about goodness? This is one that I was kind of challenged by a little bit because mainly I'm like, what is goodness? And I had to kind of wrap my mind around. We know the goodness of God. We sang about it today. But how does it apply as a fruit, okay? It's kind of unique. So let's jump into our first ver our, our verse of the day, which is our, our keynote verse is Galatians 5, verses 22 through 23. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. We say it together, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Man, isn't that awesome to know that there is no law against those things, that those things should be naturally produced in us, and that no one would have the right to say that is wrong. We get to walk in these things, and we develop these things in us, and knowing that for the long term of our life, we get to continue to grow them, and at no point will we say, well, you've had too much of that. It's against the law, right? You're too good. It's against the law. You're too kind. You're breaking the law. You have too much joy. You're breaking the law. You have too much love. You're too faithful. You can be, you can never have too much of this, which means to me that we can grow giant trees of fruit in our life, and we can continue to display that characteristic and expand upon it, and that it is limitless to what we can experience in the kingdom of God. It's limitless. I like C.S. Lewis has this quote that I found this week that I thought was really good. It said, God's goodness is not the sort of goodness that human beings would naturally expect or even necessarily want, but it is the goodness that we ultimately need. It is the goodness that we ultimately need. See, I think whenever we think of goodness, generally we think of something outside of ourselves. I think of the goodness of God. I think of the goodness of others. I think of the goodness of my community, of people here at Bethel. I think the goodness of my family. But a lot of times whenever I think of the goodness, I'm not necessarily thinking of what do I need to have more goodness in my life, generally, we kind of like, we don't want to 
have too many good things like that we're doing because we don't want to be, I guess it goes both ways. We can be one person that is like, hey, look at all the good things I've done, or we're the person that never wants to be noticed. And generally, you'll have those two paradigms. You have the person that is boasting about the fact that they learned how to tie their shoes today a different way, and then you have the other person that can just like get a perfect score on their SAT, and they're like, I just don't tell, don't tell anybody about it. So to me, there's this idea that's conflicting, and like he says, it's the, the thing that we naturally expect or necessarily even want, but it's what we ultimately need in our life. We need goodness to be evident around us as well as inside of us. So the sermon title I have for you guys today is this, The Goodness We Need. What is the goodness we need? And we got to jump into that and think about what is the goodness we need. So I have three points. They're not just, I guess, names or words. They're a little bit more of a sentence this time. It says, and I, I apologize, the white up here does not look very good. It looks a lot better back there, but, and it looks good on my graphic, but I apologize. It doesn't look good up here. So at the beginning, it says goodness. It says goodness is not about competition. It's about compassion. It's point one. Goodness is not an act. It's an awareness. Goodness is not about arriving. It's about becoming. Okay? So let's talk about goodness is not about competition. It's about uh, compassion. It's not about competition. It's about compassion. So what does the book of James say? In book of James, chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, it says this. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, good, bye, and have a good day, stay warm, eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? Going on to verse 17 and 18, he says this, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, some may argue, some people have faith and others have good deeds, but I say, how can you, how can, wait, I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. And then in Philippians 2, verses 1 and 2, it says this, Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. So thinking back to James James is talking about faith without works is dead. That's the King James. That's what I grew up with. It's saying that, hey, you got you to gotta do some stuff. You, gotta, like, you can't just say, I'm a Christian. I, I believe in God. But then you don't do anything. You don't have anything good coming out of you. You don't look at a brother and sister and say, hey, they need something and ignore it. You actually see a need and you want to step into it to make their life good. You want to step into their life and make a change. You want to put your faith to action. Now, the problem with this in the church that happens a lot of times is now our works take place of our salvation. And see, what happens is now it's a competition of how good can I be? How many good things can I do in order to make sure that my faith is secure? You're missing the point. You're missing the idea. The idea is not about how how good can I do. It's not a competition about trying to be better than someone else or trying to earn a first place prize in the kingdom of God. It's about being in the kingdom of God. It's about doing the things that were required of us, not because it's a requirement, but because we understand that it's a privilege. So now, instead of the saying, I'm doing good works because of my, my, I want to make it sure I get into heaven, I'm now doing good works because I count it a privilege to honor my king. I count it a privilege that I can say that this is not just because of 
my heart saying that I want to make sure that I'm okay with God. It's saying that man, because I'm okay with God, because I'm in the kingdom of God, because I'm in his presence, because I want to be closer to him, it takes away the competition. It takes away the weight of saying, I'm doing this to earn something, and now it's saying, I'm doing this because I get to. I think a lot of times in our lives, we get stuck in that mindset of because, I guess the opposite, we get the mindset of competition. So many times we come into church, Natalie said it to me just yesterday, I ran into Missy in Walmart, and I was telling her about it. I, I looked rough yesterday. I was like, I poured concrete and concrete countertops in my house, and I was pretty dirty, had a hat on. It was rough looking. And uh, she's like, I think, she's like, oh, it is. And I'm like, I, as I told Natalie later on, I was like, yeah, she's probably not used to seeing me like that. And she's like, yeah, you've been dressing really preppy lately. And I'm like, what do you mean preppy? <laughs> what does that mean? And I get like, with my new job, I've been dressing up a little bit more. I've been wearing more button ups. So that's why I'm wearing a t shirt today. I'm prepping down. Because, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> because I think sometimes we come into our experiences with one another vying for position. We come into our experiences with one another not from a, oh, I just want to be good, I want to be a good friend to you. But we come into it saying, I want to be the best friend for you. And not because like, oh, I'm here, I want to be best for you, but because we want that position of number one in that person's life. We want that person to want to have a connection with us all the time. And if they don't give us their full attention, if we don't earn first place, we move into somebody else. We move on to somebody else's life. We move on to somebody else that needs us more. We find the next thing that we get to take place in their life, and we get to be noticed. Because we're always competing to be seen a lot of times. And so when we look at our lives and we look at our, the scripture that James is talking about, he says, it's, you got to have works, but it doesn't come out of earning this is not earning. It comes out of a privilege and an honor because you've been given an opportunity to do this. Now, your opportunity doesn't mean that I got a reward coming. You've already got your reward. The reward is grace given upon you. Yeah. I have grace. And now, so you just get to operate it and you understand it more. You get to, you get to have faith and do the works and then faith grows inside of you. It doesn't give you new faith. Nope. It just makes that faith stronger, bigger, bolder. It grows that inside of you because now it's not competition. It's, an op it's a privilege. It's an opportunity. And so he goes on to say, like in that Philippians verse that we talked about, he goes, is there any encouragement? Is there any uh, from belonging in Christ? And I like it at the end there. He says, if you pull it perfect, then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. I think a lot of times whenever we come into a conversation and we come into a relationship or we come into a church or we come into a new anything, we want to know where we sit. We want to know where we, we line up. It's that competition. It's that, that self of belonging. It's that identity that we need. But when we take on this mindset, I'm going to try to come into it agreeing wholeheartedly with you. I'm going to come in saying, I want to see you. I want to come in with a spirit of compassion that says that I'm going to put aside my needs, my wants, my desires. I'm going to put aside me getting first place for once, me being the person that's talking all the time. I'm going to put aside all of that, and I'm going to focus on the person outside of me, the person beside me. In the conversations that you have, honestly, think about this. Who is heard more? If you're the one talking all the time, maybe it's time to be quiet. Maybe compassion for you is learning to sit and listen instead of sit and talk. Maybe it's time to start asking questions instead of giving answers all the time. 
I think I'm probably the absolute worst at this, teaching about it right now. I've gotten a lot better, but I am really guilty of this. That I go into a conversation, and they say it's something with people with ADHD, that when somebody else starts talking, that they don't need them to finish the sentence. They have already figured it out, and they've got a problem solved, and they have a solution for you. It's like if a waiter came up to you, and you said, well, I'm thinking of, and they're like, yeah, so you want the, the veal parmesan, and they're like, oh, how'd you know? It's like, yep, yeah. and you want that, like, a little extra cooked? It's like, yep, yeah, exactly. That's generally what happens with people with ADHD brains, is we are already, like, solving the problem before that person finishes their question. And it gets us in a lot of trouble because sometimes we're wrong. Actually, probably very often we're wrong. <laughs> Most of the time we're wrong and then occasionally we get something right and we feel like we're right. Actually, every now and then, once out of 100 times we're right and that makes us feel really good so we keep on trying it because as long as you try your hardest, you're a winner, right? Exactly. <laughs> You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So what happens is, is we become people that aren't so compassionate, asking, seeking to understand. We become the person that wants to be the solution to your problem. Instead of trying to lead them to the solution, which is ultimately Jesus, instead of trying to lead them to find their own understanding, their own will, their own power, we overcomplicate things by getting us in the way. We put things in a competitive mo moment with all of our conversations. And maybe that's just me. I don't know about you guys, but maybe compassion is hard for you in another way. Like, maybe you're just a type A person. Like, you're supposed to do this all the time. Like, why would you even think about sinning? Like, don't you know you're not supposed to watch shows that have bad language in it? Like, if there's anything suggestible, just turn it off. And you're like, come on, like... So I'm still learning this. Like, well, don't you know you're not supposed to associate with anybody that's bad? And so you come across judgmental. You come across a hierarchy. And maybe you don't ever say it with your words, but you say it with your actions. You don't engage in a real honest conversation with that person that you know is kind of struggling. You're like, I don't want to get involved in it because I already know what's right. And they're just not doing it. And if they're not going to do it, then <laughs> who cares? And we lose compassion for one another because it's about standing in a place of rightness instead of trying to stand in a place of goodness. Goodness, whenever we stand in it, over, it changes our mindset. Whenever I go into a competition and I'm thinking, how can I be good for the person around me? It now becomes a team. Whenever I go into a, a moment where I need to show compassion, it no longer becomes about me when I think about goodness. It becomes about the person. It becomes about the need. It becomes about what is not in my life, in my control. Goodness rights these wrongs. See, a lot of times we get stuck in that mindset of competition or compassion. And it ruins the view of goodness in our lives, it taints it, because now we start to think like, well, in order for something to be truly good, it has to benefit me. Sometimes good things in your life don't benefit you the way you want them to. Sometimes they don't benefit you the way you want them to grow your life, to bring joy to your life. Sometimes goodness in your life comes through suffering. Sometimes goodness comes to your life through loss. So, in your life, how is goodness showing up? Is it in competition or is it in compassion? And that moves us on to our second point. See, goodness is not an act. It's an awareness. It's not a single thing or a, a couple things that you do. It's not checking a box. It's not doing A, B, C, now you get goodness. I guess A, B, C, D, E, F, now goodness. It's about being aware of where you're at in the equation. Being aware of why you're doing something. And I love this story 
It's in Mark chapter 10, and it's in Matthew as well. And it's a story of the rich young ruler, and he comes up to Jesus, and, he, and I love how he starts it. And let's read it together. It says this. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him and knelt down and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus asked. Only God truly is good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and your mother. And the, the man responded, teacher. The man responded, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was a young boy. And I'm going to stop right there if you can go back. I want to point out something. He stopped calling him good teacher here. It's just interesting to me. I'm like, he recognizes that something was special about Jesus at one point, the very first interaction with him. Then at this time, he's not just a teacher. He's kind of lost respect for him. He knew who he was before, and now by the time he started talking, he's kind of gotten a little bit of an arrogance about him. And this is what he responds. He goes, I've ob obeyed all these commandments since I was young. And then he moves on. Jesus says this, looking at the young man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. I like that. He felt genuine love. There's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. See, this rich young ruler had all the acts done. He honored his mom and dad. He hadn't killed anybody. He did all the right things. He looked the part. And that gave a sense of confidence to him, because he felt like he was a good person. He felt like, I'm doing it all good. I don't. I've got it figured out. Why do I need to do this extra thing? But the thing is, is this is what we oftentimes, it's what I face in the world whenever we talk to anybody that is genuinely, genuinely a good person that doesn't come to church. We're like, I'm a good person. I don't steal from people. I don't lie. I don't cheat. I'm, I don't, like, I believe in God. I don't really need to do the whole church thing, the whole faith thing. I know there's something bigger than me, and I'm a good person. If it was built on your good works, anybody could achieve it. It's not based on your acts. It's based on your awareness. Because at the end of the day, Jesus lists the things, and according to the law, that's what makes you a good person. According to status quo, that's what made you good. But in the eyes of God, he looks deeper. He looks at what the issues of your heart are because you can do all those things. You can do all the right things. You can be the most generous person that comes to church. You can be the most faithful person that stands, stays here. You're here, you serve, and you do all of that. But if there's something inside of you that you're aware of, that you're not submitting to God, you're missing out on the fullness of God. You're missing out on the goodness that gets to live inside of you, that gets to come out of you because you've surrendered part but not whole. You're still walking around. I've heard it talked about. You're still walking around with the dead men's clothes on. Like you've been raised to life and you're a new creation, but why do you still carry a casket? of the old person. You're aware of the thing that you could change in your life if you surrendered, but you're kind of stubborn about it. I've been there. I'm probably there on times more than I think. Because if we, if we benchmark our goodness on a checklist, 
we can prove ourselves right. But if we benchmark our goodness on Jesus, we're always going to be insufficient. We're always going to be needing something more. And that's where Jesus wants you. It's where Jesus wants me. He wants us in a place of wanting more, needing more, because we know that on our own, we can only do a list. On our own, we can only accomplish quote-unquote good things, but with God, with Jesus at our side, it's no longer about just doing the good things. It's about becoming the kind of person who good things naturally flow out of. It's becoming the kind of person that naturally does the right thing and naturally wants to honor their father and mother. It doesn't become something you have to do. It's what you want to do. So when you look at your life, when you look at your heart, when you look at your mind, where do you stand up with this? Where do you stand up with with this mindset that I know what is right, Ryan? I've been there. I've (laughs) struggled I I sit here and I say, God, I come to church every Sunday and I'm doing all the right things and I still feel like there's something missing. I still feel empty. I feel like there could be more. Step into it. Ask yourself the question like Jesus did or like this rich young ruler did. Ask God, what must I do to inherit goodness, internal life? Look at it. Examine your heart. I think a lot of times we don't come to God asking questions of how to get more like him. We come to God asking for solutions to our problem. We say, God, how do you get rid of this in my life? God, how do you make me more like you? What is the area that I need to work on that's outside of my thinking that will make me more like you? That way, the thing that I'm struggling with will fade away. I don't know what it is for you, but for this man, it was his possessions, There's nowhere in the Bible that says you have to sell everything, like, really, in order to go to heaven. That is not a requirement of salvation. But it was for this man. What is a requirement for salvation for you that is different than anything you read in the Bible? It's going to be different for you. What is your hang-up? What is your hold-up? What is keeping you from being surrendered? Maybe it's your pride Maybe it's your, maybe it's an addiction. Maybe you're just so stubborn that you're not willing to admit you have a fault. What is it? It's, I know, it's challenging to think about what am I holding on to. I think it's easier at a young faith because we have a giant list. And it's harder the more mature you get. And I think for this person, the reason why it was harder, even though he was a young man, he said he'd done all the right things his whole life. His whole life he's been doing good. I think the hardest person to witness to is the person that says, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. The hardest Christian To change is the one that says, I'm doing all the things. I come to church faithfully. I serve. I give. Um, Then I can look at them and say, well, you don't look very loving. Well, but can't you see all these other things? Oh, okay. That's awesome. But do you think you can grow in love? uh, But that means I got to do exactly well, I'm doing all these other things. I'm, I'm a really loving person. Maybe you need to grow in peace. Why, do you have, why are you so anxious all the time? Why, like, what do you need to be made aware of? The hardest person is the person that's not aware. I think a lot of times, I think about this. Growing up with kids now that have B.O., <laughs> but they're not aware of it, and you're like, you stink. (laughs) Make people aware of their stink. Just being honest. Make me aware of my stink. 
Like, is there things in my life? Is there things in your life? Is there things that people are naturally walking around with that make them stinky? I know, it's kind of silly. But they're not aware of it. Their deodorant has failed, and they need to be reminded that, hey, you need this in your life. I think it is so easy to disregard those things because we become familiar with it. We get familiar with our stink. I know. I'm going to stay on it. It's a, Holy Spirit led me that one. I'm going to landing on it. I'm just going to go ahead and end the sermon. Uh, but it's true. Look at your own life. Look at yourself. Examine your heart and say, God, what have I become unaware of? What have I gotten comfortable with? What in my life have I allowed to become there that isn't good? And now it's producing a bad fruit because I'm not aware of it. I'm doing all the acts right, but there's something that I'm not aware of. I'm doing all the things that make me a Christian. I've accepted Jesus as my Lord. I'm faithful. I do good works, and not because of obligation, because I want to. But what am I not aware of, God? What is the thing that I am gotten comfortable with and gotten used to that isn't good? It's bad fruit. I want this to be good fruit in my life. And that leads me to my next point, is this in, actually, I skipped over a verse, my bad. Actually, let's read it, because I like it. Proverbs 21, verse 3, yeah. The Lord is more pleased when you do what is right and just, wait, the Lord is more pleased when we do what is right and just, uh, what is right, then just, then what, oh man, that is really hard to read, sorry, the Lord is more pleased when we do what is right, and just, that must have got copied over wrong, anyway, the idea is this, God is more pleased whenever you're just doing what is right, instead of offering sacrifices, we can sacrifice all day long, we can like, oh, begrudgingly walk through this, but he's more pleased when you just do it. You naturally walk into it. In the book of Samuel, it says it all, also this way. It says that, he, that his, uh, sacri- uh, obedience is better than sacrifice. Just to obey. I love it when my kids obey. When I don't have to ask them two times, three times, four times. When they just listen. When they just do what is right. It's pleasing to me. Whenever we as believers just do what is right, it pleases the Father. Yeah. And we read on going into goodness. The next point is this. Goodness is not about arriving. It's about becoming. In First Thessalonians, it says this. So we keep on praying for you, asking our God, to enable you to live a life worthy of his call. May he give you the power to accomplish all the good things your faith prompts you to do. Then the name of the Lord Jesus will be honored because of the way you live, and you will be honored along with him. This is all made possible because of the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. To live a life worthy of your calling. To live a life that says that I have a calling on my life. Recognize that. Recognize the fact that God chose you not about who you are right now, but about who you can be one day. He wants you to be a faithful follower of him because the life he's leading you towards is something greater than you ever could have imagined because we can't comprehend what a new life would truly look like. It's kind of like the stink. We're only aware of what we know. And when we walk into our walk with God, 
we're kind of blinded to the options ahead of us. We're blind to our own limited faith. I look at my life and I say, I never had imagined doing this. Still caught off guard by it. Never could have imagined being in a marriage that is the best thing ever. I thought after I got married that it was going to be hard. It, man, I don't see very many happy long-term marriages. They're kind of just meh. They have moments of happiness, but it's just kind of existing together. And because of where God has brought me in my own life, yeah, we still have our moments. We're human. My marriage is better than I ever could have imagined. My relationship with another person that I call special to me means more to me than anything. We have grace for one another, and she shows me the love of God that I never could have imagined in a person. But that didn't come overnight. I didn't imagine what I could have had right now at the beginning. With your walk with God, you're going to be limited to what you can see through your own eyes. You're going to say, well, I'm only going to become this. I, I, I still struggle with this so bad, so how could God ever do this with me? I mean, so it's, it's your, I one day want to arrive at a person that looks more like Jesus. Like, I hope I one day get there. No. Start doing things today that allow you to become the kind of person you want to be tomorrow. The idea of that a person worthy, a life worthy of your calling, that right there means that you're honorable in your actions. You're honorable in the way you live your life. You're saying, I want to be worthy of my calling. I know I'm not truly going to earn it, but I want the Father to look down at my life and say, well done. Man, they're doing a good job. And so in your relationships and your people with your life, where are the areas that you would say you're maybe not worthy of it? That you've been given this precious gift called salvation, that Jesus loves you so much, and you're not really honoring it. You're not really showing it the justice it deserves. You're kind of disgracing it because you've allowed this little thing to come in your life or that little thing to come in your life. And so you're not living a life worthy of your calling. You're living a life that's kind of dishonoring in that one corner. You covered it up because you think that one day I'll become, one day I'll get there, but today I'm still struggling. So I'm just going to work on that later. Expose everything. Expose it all. Stop hiding the things that hold you back from the calling that God has on you. It doesn't mean that you have to be perfect, but stop hiding it. Be honest. Say you have work to do. Put down your pride and take on humility. It's so hard. It's so hard to do that because we want to think we're a good person. I'm a good person, Ryan. I do good things, not compared to Jesus. Just say that. Not in a tear down yourself way, but in a way that says, thank God that he loves me enough to even accept me whenever I'm broken. I'm not there yet. I'm not arriving at something. I'm becoming someone. I'm becoming who God wants me to be. And so he accepts me just as I am. Because if he loved me before I was saved, why would he now stop loving me whenever I already have been? I haven't dishonored God because I'm not willing to admit my faults. I've dishonored God because I'm hiding them. I'm covering them up. I'm not being honest. I'm not sharing one with another. I'm allowing the things in my life to be God things over here and then my life. I'm holding on to me while still wanting this relationship. It's the thing that made my marriage really hard at the beginning. 
is that I still wanted to be independent Ryan that did whatever he wanted all the time. And anytime there was conflict in that, it caused strife. So I have to look at my life and say, what have I just looked at and said, one day I'll fix that. One day I'll address that issue. One day I'll take care of that and say that one day stuff needs to become today. It means I need to become who I want to be. So I'm taking the one day stuff and making it a part of my everyday life. It's a part of who I am. I'm flawed. You guys know I have anger issues. You guys know that I'm not exactly probably always going to be the most faithful. I'm not going to be the most gentle. I'm going to have issues. I'm going to have times where I fail you at communication. There's going to be times that I just let you down. There's going to be times that it's going to be hard to wake up and just do it. But because I can admit that to you, it takes away the competition of trying to make sure that I look like the number one in your eyes. I need Jesus to be here and all of us to be under it. So out of that mindset, it's not about arriving, it's about becoming who God wants you to be. This is a verse that a couple weeks ago that's a chapter of the Bible, actually, a couple weeks ago. Stuck out to me. Actually, I'm going to skip back. There was a verse I skipped, and I really want to hit it. Where is it at? Because it's important. Because it's something that we look over often. Maybe I didn't put it in here. Philippians 4, 8, and 9. There it is. Thank you. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. I like this verse because it reminds me that what are you thinking about? What is your mind fixed on? A lot of times the things that we fix our mind on aren't the positive things. The things that we dwell on are the negative things. We don't talk about, man, do you see like how nice the weather was? Do you see how like, like did it rain so much that we actually have like, saturation on the ground. It's not just hard dirt and dust out there anymore. We talk about, oh, man, like, I can't believe that rain was so hard. That was really, man, why couldn't we just get a little bit of rain at a time? And that way it just, like, why did it have to be a sloppy mess? It would have been really good if we just gotten. Instead, we generally go to the negative. We generally think about things that are, you know, bad things. If you go on your Facebook feed right now and look and to say, what's positive, what's negative? I guarantee you there's more negative than there is positive. Because we generally want to focus on the things that make us kind of feel better because maybe we're not that bad. But when you start fixing your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, and lovely, admirable, it makes you question where you're at. Whenever I read a word like admirable, I ask myself, is there somebody that admires me? Am I living a life that's admirable? Am I living a life that's lovely, pure, true? Am I thinking about a life that is creating those types of narratives for people? Or am I living a life that generally brings like negativity into the conversation? We generally focus on the negative. And so this is just one of those things that you can kind of benchmark your life with. Philippians 4, 8, and 9 is 
where am I at? What am I dwelling on? What am I fixing my thoughts on? And this kind of stuck out to me the other day, leading from that verse, is it led into Psalms verse 20, chapter 23. I was driving to work the other day. My natural desire in the car is to put on music and just listen to music, have a good time in the car, or I will be honest, sometimes watch a TV show. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> That's what I naturally want to do. Now that I drive 30 to 40 minutes to work every day, that gives me a lot of times the struggle against my flesh and say, what am I going to do? It's right today. Do I want to listen to music, which isn't a bad thing? Do I want to do what's right or what, do I want to do what's good or do I want to do what is for me? And out of that one day, the Lord just kind of stopped me in my tracks and I was like, all right, cool, God, what, what should I do today? And he's like, remember the first book of the Bible you memorized, or chapter of the Bible you memorized? And I was like, yeah, Psalms 23. He's like, try to memorize it again. I'm like, God, I kind of know it. We know we don't have to memorize anything anymore. We have Google. Like, we have our Bible on our phones. Like, we don't have to have it memorized anymore. I can just, I can just pull it up really quick. I can make a reference to it and find it really quick. I don't have to have it all memorized. He's like, try to memorize it again. And so I stopped, and I said, okay, what am I going to focus on? Goodness, or am I going to focus on me? And this is what it came out, Psalms 23. It says this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. And this is the part that I didn't understand till like 15 minutes before we came up to worship today. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When you look to Jesus as your good shepherd, as you let him be the good guide of your life, surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. You're going to have moments where you're sitting at the table with your enemy. You're going to have moments where you're going to need a rod and a staff to comfort you. That doesn't seem always comforting, but it is correcting you, reproving you. The idea of laying down beside the still waters, leading me into paths of righteousness, not for me, but for his name. And this all comes out about dwelling in a place with Jesus. So, the thing I have to end it with for you guys is this. Where is goodness growing in your life? Where is goodness growing in your life? With my last point, is it this? Is goodness growing in competition or is it in compassion? Is goodness growing in your actions or in your awareness? Is goodness growing by you arriving at something one day or who you're becoming today? Are you dwelling in the presence of God? Or are you just randomly getting there every now and then? Are you choosing to enter into the goodness of God all the time and remind yourself about it? Are you focusing on the negative things? Are you focusing on what is pure, true, and right? Are you focusing on what is wrong, down, pressed, and just hard? Change your thoughts. Change your actions. Change your heart. 
And it starts by saying, like the rich young ruler did, what must I do? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, today, Lord, I pray right now that as we sit here and we think about the goodness of God in our life, it's easy to think about the good things that have happened to us, Lord, but I pray right now that we become the type of person that carries the fruit of goodness in our life. Lord, that goodness starts to be evident in how we live and how we carry ourselves and, and what we watch and what we talk about and how we act to treat one another, that goodness is what people would say, not that we're a good person, but that we can say that, man, they just have something that's good about them. And it's because we tap into you. Lord, I pray that you make us aware of where we're at in this journey. Lord, I pray that you take off the blinders, or like we came out in this sermon, that you make us aware of the stink. Lord, make us aware of the thing that we've gotten comfortable with that isn't good. Lord, make us aware of the thing we need to change or the things we need to change, the things we need to surrender so that goodness can grow in us. Lord, I love you today, and I thank you for your word. I thank you that it challenges us and reproves us and corrects us like the rod and the correction do. Lord, but I thank you that you can lead us beside still waters. I thank you that you can restore our souls. I thank you that you can lead us into paths of righteousness and that surely goodness and mercy will be following us all the days of our life. In your name we pray, amen. As always, these altars are open. Um, your chairs are open if you need to pray, sit, talk. Um, but at the same time, you're more than welcome to leave until we come back again. Hopefully see you on Wednesday night. But God bless you guys and have a great day.